2,000 years ago, the seed of a civilization, a startup, if you will, sprung into being in seven hills in Central Europe. Now, that startup would go on to scale and sustain itself for over 500 years of one of the greatest cultural and economic powerhouses we've ever known. Now, at the peak of its power, the Roman Empire accounted for roughly 20% of the world's population and covered more than 2 million square miles. Now, there's lots of hypotheses about what allowed this civilization to seed, scale, and sustain itself for such a period of time. Does anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> roads, good. Roads always comes up. Great. What else? Aqueducts, any more? Common language. Common language, excellent. Right, well, the, the truth is all of these things contributed, but there was one strongest hypothesis. You know, what, the innovation uh, about this civilization was very unique. You see, as soon as Rome conquered other cultures, as soon as they recognized practices that were better than their own, they let go of their existing practices and incorporated those practices into their systems of operation. Essentially, they created a governance mechanism that allowed them to both learn and unlearn. And this is what helped them to scale, sustain, for over 500 years. Now, the idea of learning organizations is not probably new to many of these people. When Peter Singh wrote this phenomenal book, The Fifth Discipline, around systems thinking and learning organizations, it exploded into being in the 1980s. Everybody was a learning organization. Is there anybody here who doesn't work for a learning organization at the moment? Now, at the same time, while this fantastic book was being released and, and written, uh, another idea was talked about, but nobody seemed to notice it. The first concept of unlearning actually came from Bo Henberg. Uh, and he described it as, as knowledge grows, it simultaneously becomes obsolete. So really what we need is a system to help us recognize when to discard obsolete or outdated information and take in new information to change the way we operate. And everyone thought that was great. And nothing changed. You know, the most valuable companies in the world at the time, even 10 years after Singh's learning organizations were still, how big can we become? How can we build big organizations, big build moats, number one in our industry? 10 years after that, the same. Go on, button. There we go. Very little actually changed until suddenly everything changed, where we had organizations who actually started to build platforms and services that allowed them to learn massively about how customers interacted with their products and services, what worked, what didn't, and adapt their behavior. You see, this is a very common pattern that happens to all of us, especially leadership. We get trapped believing the things that made us successful yesterday will be the things that make us successful tomorrow and the next day. We have a very natural, linear mindset for change. But the truth is, change happens much more in an exponential type curve. Things that look sort of odd are the things that actually turn into be massive innovations and change the way we currently think. So my argument to you is this. It's not actually organizations that get disrupted. The truth is, it's individuals. We get trapped holding on to the behaviors and thinking that made us successful in the past, believing it will make us successful in the future. So this got me really excited when I started to think about these sorts of challenges. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes at the moment from Gary Hamill, and I think it really like, just typifies the world we're in. Right now, we have these amazing 21st century technologies, all built on top of 20th century management processes built on top of 19th century management principles. Who has a friend who works in a company like this? Who here does annual planning? Does anyone know when that innovation was created? 1907, Charles McKinsey 
working with the automotive industry because that's how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun. Who here uses annual performance reviews? Great. Does everybody wait once a year to get better? <laughs> and the question to you is, why do you do those processes? Because we always have. So this is what I want you to start thinking about as we go through this talk. You see, it got really, really interesting to me about why do we behave in this way? What makes us continue to hold on to the practices we believe made us successful if they ever did at all? Now, I coach a lot of senior executives from some of the most amazing companies in the world. They're phenomenally interesting people to work with. But what I found was, while learning new things is tough, what was even more difficult for them was to unlearn their existing behavior and thinking, especially if it had turned them into CEOs of these companies. Now, and that got me excited about this idea of unlearning. And when I say to people about you're going to have to unlearn, most people get pretty angry at me. Because they're like, I've spent 20, 30, 40 years in my career building up all this expertise, and now you're telling me it's wrong? I'm not telling you it's wrong. I'm telling you is what we need a system to recognize when we are holding on to outdated information. So the way I describe unlearning is this. Unlearning is the conscious act of moving away from once useful mindsets and acquired behaviors that were successful in the past, but now limit our success. So it's the conscious act of letting go of outdated information and making space for new information to come in to inform our decision-making in action. It's actually a system where you recognize when you need to unlearn. So now your next question is, well, how do I know I need to unlearn, Barry? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, I can see you look excited. That's good. <laughs> I want you to think about this, right? Just t get your notes ready to think about this. So where is there a situation where you're not achieving the outcomes that you're aiming for? Maybe there's another situation where you're not living up to your expectations you have of yourself. Maybe there's a situation that you're avoiding, or you've tried everything you can think of, and you're still not getting the results you want. These are all signals that your existing behavior is not driving the outcomes that you want, and you need to unlearn. And this was really interesting to me. Because when I started to recognize that in myself, I could start to coach people. Recognizing where they needed to unlearn and start to relearn new behaviors by starting small with new behaviors to get the breakthroughs that they need to drive the outcomes that they want. And I recognized it was actually a system, a virtuous system that the more you could recognize where you had limitations, experiment with new behaviors, and get breakthroughs, it became a virtuous system to allow you to continually innovate your behavior. So here's my question for you. I want you to take 30 seconds. Think about those questions I just asked you. Where are you not living up to your expectations? Where are you struggling and not achieving the results you want, specifically around the future of work? 30 seconds to think about it. And then I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you and say 30 seconds about what challenge you're struggling most with and give them 30 seconds to share that challenge back with you. Are you ready? All right, look at a partner beside you. This is your chance to get to know your neighbor. Everybody ready? OK, 30 seconds each. Off you go. So were you not achieving the outcomes that you're aiming for, not living up to your expectations, situations you're avoiding, struggling, tried everything you can think of and you still can't get it to work?
Okay, 30 seconds more. Okay. All right. So who wants to share some of the challenges that they came up with? Anyone come up with some challenges they want to share? Just shout them out. Anybody come up with a challenge? Who's finding the future of worth incredibly easy and wants to help us all understand how to do it? Right, the work can get done outside the world. How do we get people to even understand or recognize that? Great. One more? Yeah, great. Right, why can't we do it? Our team get defensive when we try to bring in other new people. Great, right? These are all real challenges we're all facing. So I'm going to show you in the next 20 minutes how you can start to address some of these challenges. Because as I said, this was a system that I started to recognize as working with these amazing people, is that how do we start to adopt new behaviors to drive the outcomes that we want? Because typically, when we get in front of these new innovation programs, what's the big kickoff speech? What's the first thing the CEOs always say when they're kicking off the big innovation program or future work program? Vision, great, right? What I always hear is, we need to transform. And what are they really saying? You're all going to transform. I'm going to keep doing what I've always done. Right? And so there's some characteristics we really got to cultivate within ourselves if we're serious about trying to unlearn. And they're uncomfortable. The first one is curiosity. Simply, your expertise can become your blind spot. When's the last time that someone tried to solve a problem in a different way from you as to the way you would solve it? And instead of telling them they were wrong, you were like, that's interesting. One of my favorite uh, collaborators, CEO of HSBC, used to sit down with grads the first week they came in and give them problems he was working on so we could learn or unlearn how they solve it, how we would do it differently. Ownership. So when things don't go right, who do you point the finger at? Is it that other team? Is it the people that we brought in to help us? Or do you own the results yourself and take action? You need commitment because you're going to do things that you're not good at and struggle to do as you work through them. That means you've got to be comfortable with getting uncomfortable. And the way you do that is you create safety. You think big, but you start small and figure out what's going to work best for you in your context to get the breakthroughs that you need. So I'm going to share a couple of examples of companies I work with. And I love to start with this one, mindset, because I hear this so much. We just have a mindset problem here. If we just shifted our mindset, everything would be perfect. So how do we currently shift uh, executive leadership mindset? What's the behavior we do to do that at the moment? Does anyone know? Well, we sit you in rooms and talk at you for two days. <laughs> $365 billion a year, and yet only one in four people say it drives any impact on the outcomes that they're trying to drive, and yet, Everyone jumps on planes and flies to Stanford, sits in a room for two days, picks up their badge, and flies home. Do you change your behavior? No. And yet we still do this method. You see, the way you get people to start thinking differently is they have to start acting differently. You've got to act your way to a new culture. You can't think your way there. You've got to take action. And the thing is, by when you start to behave differently, you get a new perspective of the world. And that perspective gives you contrary information that runs against your existing mental model. And that's what shifts your behavior. So if you want to think differently, you've got to start by acting differently to get there. One of my clients is International Airlines Group. They're the sixth largest airline group in the world. They own British Airways, Iberian Avenue. You probably know these company. You've probably flown with them. Now, they recognize that they couldn't keep sending their leadership on these two-day training programs and expecting them to start innovating their behavior and having lasting impacts. So what we did is we took six of their senior executive team out of their business for eight weeks with the goal of launching six new businesses to disrupt their existing organization. 
Normally when I say things like that, people panic. They're like, how could you get rid of an exec for eight weeks? Please show me how to do that. <laughs> you get them to work on cool stuff. But one of the first things we did is when we got them together is one of the executives for British Airways was like, I've got this amazing idea to transform the airline booking experience. I've been in the industry for 20 years. We just need to build my idea. I was like, okay. Do you want to test it? No, we don't need to. Just let's build it. Well, let's test it. Okay, I'll try and test it. So we got them a customer. They showed them their amazing idea. How do you think it went? It went something like that. <laughs> what was the executive's reaction? Let me, let, me, let me explain the idea. No, they went even further. Get me the right customer. <laughs> good, good, good. We did it again. We did it again. And we did it again, and we did it again. <laughs> and then we had this a moment where we sat down and we reflected on what was happening. And I asked the exec, what do you think is happening? And they're like, it's the idea that sucks, not the customer. And that was like this unlearning moment for them. They realized that their existing behavior, their expertise was actually holding them back. A lot of the, they started to see a lot of their assumptions as hypotheses as things that they needed to test as quickly as possible to find out if they were true or not. It reactivated their curiosity. So the next time when we sat down and they were like, what do you think your amazing idea? The customer said, it sucks. They were like, great, how can I make it better? They started to realize that they were pushing their ideas onto people instead of pulling them. Because what do good executives do? They make decisions and tell people what to do. Really interesting moment for them. Now, this was an amazing program, right? We totally changed the way companies like IOG operated. They opened up all their APIs to make them available for different companies and partners to start building on top of their assets. But we had four or five ideas that we couldn't complete in the time. So we decided we would just push them back into the uh, organization to start working on. How do you think that went? Good. You, you, you must have been part of the show. Again, we were pushing ideas into people who were already at maximum capacity. They've already got their own ideas. Who are we to tell them what ideas they should be working on that are great? But that was another great unlearning moment for the company. Because we realized that actually what we needed to create was an ecosystem of different people who could work with us to leverage these ideas, to test them as quickly and possible as the ways we never thought of. We launched the first venture firm ever for the airline industry. It's called Hangar 51. I highly recommend you check it out. And the innovation breakthroughs have been amazing. We've found companies and partners and individuals who are building some of the most amazing software I've ever seen in my life. This is um, a, the turnaround of an airline. It normally takes, if you're lucky, somewhere in the region of about 25 minutes. It can have all sorts of breakages. I know most people who flew from San Francisco to here, like me, had two planes that were delayed. This has made the turnaround time reduction from something like 25 minutes to five minutes, and the problem identification process, literally like minutes about what part of the plane could be working from a camera just looking at the plane as it comes in. These are all amazing innovations that BA didn't have the capability to build and brought partners in to help them build these types of things. And in some instances, took equity in those businesses as they started to use their assets and accelerate. Super interesting ideas about what's ahead of us in the future of work. You know, and, and this is one of the interesting things for me is because the moment for me was this Scott was the chief innovation officer for IAG at the time. And he would always say, the moment when everyone tells you to stop, it's not working. This is a bad idea. That's when you've got to double your experiment velocity to get the breakthrough that you need. And the lasting change for them has not been blockchain identity management solutions. It's been the culture change, the leadership shift in their thinking going back and coaching other people how to do this. Another example is measuring success. And this is one of the biggest problems I see for most organizations. We're trapped in this world of command and control. Does anyone know uh, when command and control was invented or was actually usurped? Well, most people tell me the army used command and control, their high performance organization. The army abandoned command and control in the 18th century at the Napoleonic Wars because they realized when people were in situations of opportunity or threat, they didn't have time to write a 400-page PowerPoint deck 
wait for the next uh, steering group meeting to show to their boss and get signed off. And it's, right? So the army operate on this idea of con the principle of mission. What's the key outcome to be achieved? We need to take that hill. And then they trust small autonomous teams with their skills and expertise to make decisions at speed aligned to achieving that outcome. Right? And this method is moving from mission command, I think, to more away from command and control. Because we're all in the business of achieving outcomes. And outcomes are comprised of plans that have series of actions in them. And there's gaps that appear, right? What we think will happen versus what will happen, what we do versus what we think we will do, and the effects we get. Now, what happens in low-performing organizations is this. Who here is working on a current three-year digital transformation future of work plan to save the whole business? Anyone working on that? All right, so what's the first thing you have to do when you come up with that idea, first of all? Well, the leaders say, that's a great idea. I'd like to see a three-year plan. I want more information. So you build a three-year plan. And then as soon as you've got the three-year plan done, they're like, well, I want to know all the actions you're going to perform for that three years. So can I see every detail of every task you're going to do for the next three years? And then just to make sure you don't do anything that they want you to do, I want to know how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take for every single thing. Who has a friend who works in a company like that? Right? And what happens after you've made this amazing 400-page PowerPoint? Well, the world changes, right? You've got to do it all again. Now, high-performance organizations get good at describing outcomes. Here's what we expect to happen, what success is and why it matters. And then they trust their teams to giving them that intent to figure out how to get there. So if you're serious about scaling your impact, you've got to get good at giving people clear outcomes and trusting them with ways to get there. So I coached the executive team of a very well-known bank. You can try and guess who they are. Samuel L. Jackson might use them. And one of the challenges that we had was that they were spending over five months of the year just planning and only seven months actually even executing. Five months writing a hypothesis, seven months, if they're lucky, experimenting. So we started to shift to a more outcomes-based approach by writing hypotheses about what success was. If we were going to drive success, transform our business, what would it look like? And we started to write things like, well, customers would be using our system more. They'd be happier. They'd be more productive. We could then quantify and constrain that and say, well, 80% would be more. Well, what about our teams? What would they be doing? How would we know they're working better? How would we know collaboration is happening better in the company? And then they're done. Their planning process went from months to literally weeks, six weeks. Leadership teams sit down, come up with these hypotheses, communicate them to teams, and let teams start experimenting to see what gets there. The CEO of the company had never worked in an agile way before. After a month together, we did a retrospective, and he stuck at this post-it note up on the wall. And all his team were in shock. And he's like, I thought we were being agile, but I realized we just focused on outputs, not outcomes. His team were in shock. Then he went back to his desk, wrote an email, and sent it to the whole organization. That was the sign. 50,000 people got that, where he said, hey, we're trying to work in a new way. Figured out it's actually really hard. So bravo to everybody who's out there trying new things, because we know how difficult it is even as a team for us to do it. In that email, he created agency, safety, an opportunity for other people to start experimenting in new different ways and bringing different types of ways of working into the organization. Role model the, the behaviors you want to see in others and yourself. Because the whole point of this is that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to this. You need to start thinking of your work as a portfolio of options. You'll have different ideas that you're exploring. They should be small bets that you're making, different suppliers that you might work with, different sources of talent that you might work with. Because in a lot of instances, most of our ideas, they suck. So it's better that we find out quickly and cheaply how that is and iterate and move fast. You know, measures of success and explore are different when you start to exploit and grow these products right through to sustaining them. And if you're lucky, maybe you get to retire some of your legacy platforms. Who are the type of people that can help you do this work? Is it everybody in your company? Is there different people that you can bring in to do that? Is there expertise you're lacking? You've got to start thinking about optionality in your portfolio of work. 
and where is it most optimal to leverage talent? Because ultimately, every business model will be disrupted. It's only a matter of when. But also, your working practices are going to be disrupted because some people want to work on certain types of initiatives. So how can you create space for those people in your organization? Where are your gaps? There's so many fascinating organizations emerging. You know, and the single site sort of model is really feels like legacy to me at this stage. But what I'm really interested in these sorts of organizations here, who knows or has heard of Fortright? Anyone with a kid is probably sick of it. People always ask me, what does great leadership look like in the future? Where do you think kids of today are learning what leadership is? Fortnite is a game. Fortnite is a game where anybody can go into a digital world and start to play and lead other people in movements. Does anyone ever hear of EXP, reality? They're a billion dollar, 12,000 person real estate company that has no offices, that most people have never met each other and operate in a virtual world. Does it sound like I'm crazy? This is their uh, AGM. These are different people coming from all different entities under a common mission that they care about. This is their office. They built a virtual island that people hang out on. You know, if they decide they want to get rid of the football field, they can turn it into a stadium. These are the kind of future of work areas to think about. For any of you who've spent time and even looked at the amazing um, report of future of work from Upwork, so many of these stats, this, this is the future of work. This is the trends that we're moving towards, right? 37% of people think that they'll have remote workers in less than nine years. Again, we have a linear mindset. What will happen is exponential. So you need to start thinking about your portfolio of bets, about how your organization is going to start to understand and incorporate this future of work, these amazing talent. Because I think the classic uh, quote needs to be revised. You see, the future of work is already distributed. It's just not evenly here. And I want you to really think about that. Because it's about moving the work to the talent now, not bringing the talent to the work. So here's what I want you to do. One more quick exercise. I want you to look at that challenge that you wrote down. I want you to think big about if you totally obliterate that challenge, what outcome would that look like? What would be some of the things that people would be doing differently today, or sorry, in the future than they're doing today? And here's your little exercise for the next 30 seconds. See how, write down how many small behaviors maybe a little uncomfortable behaviors you could do today to start moving towards that outcome. You've got 30 seconds. Go. Write them on your notepad. Write them in your head. You see, what happens is most people get to one or two really easy because you put down stuff that's really comfortable. But you struggle to get past that. And again, this is our natural, linear, incremental mindset holding on to what's comfortable. Try and challenge yourself and do something that's a little uncomfortable. And the best way to do that is when you're on the break, share what you come up with with somebody you meet, and get them to challenge you a little bit and go, what would be a little bit more uncomfortable? Share what you've got. And then the next challenge I want you to think about is pick one of those behaviors and try it today. The path to unlearning is super challenging. But the people who embrace this get amazing results. People from all over the world have been in touch with me. This was my favorite person who got in touch. Well, not this, this person. Anyone know who this lady is? Greatest athlete of our time. We've even had Stefan come talk to me on my podcast. I've built software where people can start to use it. People who are leadership who are embracing the things that made them successful 
in the past mightn't be the things that make them successful in the future. So while you're here today, don't waste the opportunity to collaborate with other people who understand the challenges of the future of work, but also some of the new behaviors you're going to have to adopt as you start to tackle these questions to move forward as a community. Rome lasted for 5,000 or 500 years, and then it started to turn inward. Caesar turned his back on the world instead of embracing growth and opportunity. Europe plunged into the Dark Ages for over 2,000 years, only to return through the Renaissance, one of the greatest times of creativity and information sharing and growth our world has ever known. Be your own Renaissance person and start your journey to learn to how to unlearn. Thank you very much.